Okay, do you have any thoughts or questions about what we've just done before we move on? Okay. I left you then with a very simple question about reading the Gospels. If they are memoirs, it's perhaps sometimes good to read them as memoirs and to have a sense that John's writing these memoirs so that his joy will be complete. What will make his joy complete? If he can share with you what he has, which is to give you the possibility of having the same relationship with Jesus and the Father as he does. That's an extraordinary thing because it, it means that what we've got here is something which goes beyond normal memoirs. Like some, someone or a politician, you've got politicians here, they'll write memoirs so that you will you will you will think it the way they think it, so that you will remember it the way they remember it. But of course the person on the other side remembers it differently. So you've got two different sets of memoirs. But what's the point of the memoir? It's not simply to put down historic facts, it's so that you will think the way I think. That's what happens with a political memoir. Okay? Um, if you were to write a memoir, if you were a World Youth Day, you would want to somehow in the memoir put down there something which would capture the experience. Whose experience? Your experience of World Youth Day. Okay? Um, and so on. It's the attempt to capture an experience. It, that means that if it were possible to read the Gospels in such a way that I could also take that experience in such a way that it becomes in some way part of my experience, <coughs> therefore within the context of the living church, part of the church's memory of Jesus Christ. You want something called tradition. Okay? And that's really behind all that is what the Catholic Church proposes. But I'm just putting it to you in simple terms rather than in, in theological terms. But it, it comes back to seeing the Gospels not simply as a receptacle of, of truths of the faith. Okay, it's a terrible way of thinking of something. Because that's if John thought that you read the Gospels as, as, a, as a, well let's use a nice word, a treasure trove of the truths of the faith, it's a nice thing, but you'd be horrified. Because what he's got to hear is something personal. Therefore, we need to find a way to be engaged personally by the Gospels. And that's not as simple as sitting sit down and praying and saying, what are you saying to me? Okay, that's not very helpful either. That's what many people do, say, open the Gospels and see if they speak to me. There's something narcissistic about that, in fact. It's kind of, no, there's a, there's a sense in which what you've got here is something extraordinary which I want to make part of my life so that what it needs to speak to me it will. Okay? Because the Word of God must have its own freedom. It's not a tool that I can pick up and say, I'll open here, let it speak to me. But that's, that's like spiritual roulette. But rather, if the Scriptures could be so part of me as of what I need, God will use it for me. And so, as a Carmelite, one of the things I was taught is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, must be in your heart and on your lips. Let nothing be done without the accompaniment of the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, must be in your heart and on your lips. A twofold thing. Let nothing you do be done except with the accompaniment. And our rule also tells us to be meditating on the law of the Lord day and night in our cell. It's a funny thing we'll come to that because that's almost exactly what Jesus teaches us. The meaning of which is, is quite obscure, it's not obvious. So I suggested that the way it was to simply ask the question, what is it like to be Jesus? What is it like to be Peter? What is it like to be John? And let me tell you why that's important. Because if I know what it's like to be John, humanly I've got access to that gospel. If I know what it's like to be Jesus, humanly I have access to that gospel. And if it so happens 
that at this very moment I'm feeling like John, I have experiential immediacy to that gospel now. Because that gospel is me now. If I know what it is experiential, if I know what it's like to have a sense of what it's like to be Jesus in this gospel, and I happen to be like that now, I have access to Jesus now. A funny thing, that's what he told us to do in Matthew's gospel. Come to me, all you who labor and overburden, and I will give you rest. Shoulder my yoke and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. Yes, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He says, Come to me with your burdens. I will give you rest. I won't take the burdens from you, but I will share with you my yoke, my burden, so that you can learn from me. Implicit in that is, I come to him and I learn how to carry my burden because it's the same burden that he carries. Implicit in that is, I learn about Jesus by learning about myself in all authenticity. Because the only way I can learn to be myself is through Jesus. That's the meaning I believe of come to me. What is my burden? What do I labor with? Me. You're not my burden. My burden, as I proposed to you when I try to love my neighbor and then to go to prayer, is me. And when I go to prayer, I bring myself to prayer. Everything. Good and bad. Horrible and joyful. And I don't know how to be me. And the only way I can learn to be me is by learning from Jesus. You must love one another as I have loved you. How has Jesus loved me? I must, think I must go there and be there. So that somehow has to be what we're going to the scriptures for. And therefore, it requires a certain kind of reading. And a certain kind of purposeless. You have to be purposeless for when you read them. You're not reading them to find out the story. You're not reading them for theology. But I'm reading it for salvation. I'm reading it for relationship with God. I'm reading it, as John says, because I believe for me this is life. So when I'm reading the Gospels, I'm reading about his life. But I'm reading about his life because I'm reading about my life. And if I can read in such a way that my life through these memories connects to his life, because it is obvious that these memories for John are the way that his life connects with, John's life connects with Jesus' life. Okay? That's what's happening in the memory. And if I can have access to it this way, that I've got something quite extraordinary. So now we've got five things. Prayer, renunciation, and love. Lived in the presence of Jesus, walking with Jesus. And the way what is given to us to, to hold these together is in fact the Word of God. Okay, so now I can now begin to turn to the question that I want to look at um, today, and that's only the first of the three things of letter, which is prayer. And the real question that I want to ask now, by engaging the scriptures, is what was Jesus' prayer? Okay? I mean, what Father Greg Homie's prayer is, it's, it's a, it's in, why would you want to know that? It's not great at all. I'm struggling with it. And please, God, it might start to fall into place two minutes before I go. <coughs> that would be tough enough. So, what's my. And you might think, you said, what Teresa and John of the Cross's prayer is. Well, that's fine. You can look there because they were very close to Jesus. But the, the fundamental teacher of prayer must be the Lord Himself. It's certainly not me. St. Teresa writing in the book of her life, which she finished in 1562, an extraordinary book, you should read St. Teresa's writings. The book of her life, in fact, was the last thing which brought Teresa Benedict of the Cross or Edith Stein into the Catholic Church. When she had read that book, she said, it's about love, 
and truth, she said, um, she was a philosopher, a very quite famous philosopher from Breslau. She was a, a student of Husserl. The other student of Husserl was Martin Heidegger. He was a true believing Nazi. And Edith Stein didn't like him so greatly. She said, his philosophy has no heart. There was a comment about uh, Heidegger's philosophy. But she said, I, who had spent my whole life searching for the truth, at this point, before then, she was an agnostic moving towards Christianity. She said, when I'd finished this book, which she read from cover to cover in one reading, she couldn't put it down, she said, I have met someone who has found the truth. And I've spent my whole life looking for the truth. I've made one step forward. I've even met someone who's found it. She went up to Carmelite and died as a martyr, of course. But she met in St. Teresa, someone who had found Jesus. That was the extraordinary thing. And yet, she's not our primary teacher of prayer. Because she writes in the book that I, I referred to, that uh, Edith Stein read, that she got to the point where nobody could help her. No book she could find would help. And our Lord appeared to her and said, Daughter, fear not, because from now on I will be your book. And implicit in that statement is, the Lord himself now began to teach her <coughs> how to pray. And that what she learned is, is the topic of another retreat day. But if I want to know what prayer is, I have to go to Jesus. And that means I have to go to the Gospels this way, the way that I'm suggesting to you. Because Jesus came to do what? What was his fundamental thing? I have revealed to you everything that my Father has revealed to me. I do what I do, what I see my Father doing, I'm quoting at the moment from St. John's Gospel. But he came into the world to show us who his Father was. He came into the world to lead us into relationship with his Father. Incidentally, anything which is authentically Marian is Mary wanting to lead us into relationship with her Son, just as he came to lead us into relationship with his Father. Okay? Never get those things wrong. Okay? The focus in the end must be God, and it must be Jesus. Because Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, who is at one with the Father. And so Christian's life is always towards the Father through Jesus. That is so important in our prayer, because it's, it's this relationship. Okay, so before we move on now, looking at the Gospels, I want to ask you a question. It's a question that I ask many people. If you could pick two scenes from the gospel that you could. The angel Gabriel appears and says, I've been given the power to send you back into two scenes in the gospel. Which would you go back to? To tantalize it. Yeah, I could, now I know which two, but before I worked out the two, I could spend the whole day pondering that. I'd have a great time. I can't imagine anything much more enjoyable, really. But the two that I would pick are these. Chapter 21 of St. John's Gospel, which is where Jesus is by the shore of the lake and he's cooked breakfast on a cold morning. And they come to him and they sit down and they eat with him. And no one is saying a word. I, I can't imagine a nicer way to be with our Lord. I wouldn't have wanted to be in America. I'm not interested in America. I don't think I wanted to be there for his teaching largely either. So I probably would have eventually fallen asleep or something. But I would have loved to have been there just having breakfast with him. It's so beautiful, so lovely. And the other thing is, I would have loved to have seen him pray. Look, when you look at the Gospels, the thing which is, con which is constantly happening in the Gospels is Jesus is going away to pray. In every religious order in the church, 
strives to identify with something about Jesus. So the Dominicans is about preaching, the SVDs is about missionary work, with the Franciscans it's about simplicity, with the discussed Carmelites, it's his prayer. It's his prayer. It's um, to live his relationship with his Father and try to show others what that is, so that they, they might have that relationship. And for me, the most precious thing in Jesus' life is not what he does, but his relationship with his Father. That's why, I, for me, I'm, it's a very great privilege to be in this house Carmelite, because my job in the church is to, is to try to have this relationship. And in the poor way that I live my life, and I hope that others will also be drawn into that relationship with God. <coughs> That's the common thing in Jesus' life. And let's, before we start to work out what it is, see how it's specified, how it's present in the Gospels. When is the first moment of prayer in Jesus' life as we have it in the Gospels? It's there in the three synoptic Gospels, the 40 days in the desert. We'll come back to that. Then we find that in, in the next, there are three climactic moments in his life. The baptism, the desert, and the temptation, they are one unit. The next unit is the confession of Peter, leading to what happens six or eight days later, depending upon which gospel you read, and they go to the mountain to pray, and there he's transfigured. The third significant moment, of course, is his death and resurrection. There, the, that's, that's the... That's the kernel of the Gospel. And what happens there in Matthew's Gospel? He goes away in all the synoptics. They, they go to the garden. What do they go there for? To pray. So we look at Jesus' life. He begins with prayer. It ends with prayer. In the middle there is prayer. And in between that we're told he would get up early in the morning before the sun came to go away to be alone with his father to pray. And that wonderful passage when all the disciples have come back, this is in Mark's Gospel, all the disciples come back from doing all this ministry, and he says, you are tired, you haven't even had enough time to eat. Let us go away to a lonely place. And he said, they, they're about to go, but the crowds come. Wonderful thing, the, the lovely compassion of Jesus. He sent his disciples away, but he attended crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. What happens next after he deals with the crowd? What does he do? Does he go to his disciples? No. He goes away on his own to pray somewhere else. And every time he walks across the water when they're in the boat, he's coming from a place of prayer. Okay, so this forms in terms of Jesus' private life it's the common thing we see. The rest is ministry. The rest is for others. When we look at Jesus' life in terms of for himself, he's always going away to pray. Okay? Now, let's ask ourselves another question. Because we've got the example of his prayer as given to us in the Gospels. But we're also given two very precious things. Because at one point in Luke and Matthew's Gospel, effectively the disciples come and say, teach us to pray. And he gives them the Our Father. We need to look at that because that's very important. But we have to understand what he's really saying and where it's coming from. And the other very precious, precious moment is in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus, overcome with fear, falls to the ground and prays. And he actually, we, we get his words. We hear the words that Jesus prays to his father. They're, they're, they're precious. Do you know what they are? Have you thought about them? Do you know what they are? My father, if it is possible, take this cup from me, but nevertheless your will be done. You need to look at those words very carefully, because that's Jesus at prayer. Have you thought about the words he said? Now, it's also there's a number of other things. Another peculiar thing about Jesus' prayer, and it's there in the Garden of Gethsemane. They went to the garden, and he went away with Peter, James, and John to another place. 
so they could see what was happening. And then he went further away again and said, you wait here and don't sleep. When he went to the mountain to pray, he took with him Peter, James and John, the same people as in the Garden of Gethsemane, who went to a <coughs> private place. But we're told this when they asked him about prayer, when he was alone praying in their presence. It's a funny, funny statement, isn't it? How can I be alone praying? If I sat here praying, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel that I was alone. But they thought he was alone. To pray in the presence of someone is the last way you would think of praying alone. If you were praying alone, you'd go away so that there's nobody there. But for them, he was praying alone in, in their presence. So they saw him pray. Number one. Number two, I think this intrigued them greatly. Simply by the way that they said, he prayed alone in their presence. Because that's not what we would say. What are they saying? He was praying, but he wasn't. He was praying in our presence, but he wasn't praying with us. It's obviously what it means when he says he was praying alone. Because the word alone here, when you're in the midst of people, to pray, if we sit here and we all pray alone, it means we're all praying privately. The alone doesn't mean necessarily absolute physical alone, because that's not what was happening in the gospel. So if I was to say, let's spend some time alone in prayer, does that mean you all have to race outside and find a place where you can't be seen? Or do I mean to say, <coughs> just pause a moment and pray privately? The alone here, I believe, means pray privately. And this is what intrigued them. The first thing we know about is prayer. He prayed alone, and I don't believe they were used to praying alone. Because what was the fundamental Jewish prayer? As we know it, it was the temple prayer, which was of the high feast days. <coughs> That, that are given to us in, in John's Gospel. And remember in John's Gospel, towards the Passover there, I wonder, I wonder whether he will come up to Jerusalem for the feast day. That means I wonder whether he will come to temple for the temple worship. That was one kind of Jewish prayer. What was the second kind? We're told that it was his custom to go to the synagogue on Saturday. Okay, and notice about these things, these things are, we are praying, okay, these are the community praying. And as you recognise this, you'll recognise his teaching on prayer more specifically. And the third thing is what's not given in the Gospels, but which we know is part of the Jewish tradition, and that is the family ritual on Shabbat, when the family gather. That after the first sighting of the evening star, the planet Venus, they gathered together to celebrate as a family the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is what defines them in many ways. It's a beautiful thing to reflect upon. You should reflect upon what the Sabbath is rather than waste your time asking yourself what to do on the Sabbath. Because until you recognize what it is, how do you ever know what to do on the Sabbath? But we don't have time to look at what it is today. So, those three things. Once you see that, you can see he's doing something different. He would go away with them and alone in their presence pray. And they're all looking at him. And obviously they're wondering, what on earth is he doing? Have you ever seen a holy person pray? I know both of you have. Our Father Hilary, 75 years in Carmelite. I know he was a holy man. I heard his confession before he died. And he asked me for permission to die the day before he died because I was the preacher of the time. And the day before he died, he wanted to talk to me about the infant Jesus because he was, as he was dying, was reflecting upon the child Jesus. And he was worried that he may be having an, an heretical thought coming to the end of his life. He didn't want to think something which was contrary to the truth. It was beautiful in his thoughts, actually. I said, no, 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 Father, it's spot on. And then he asked for permission to that very holy man, but if you'd seen him praying, you'd want to pray like him. 
adjust the way we would sit there for the hour in the morning and the hour in the evening, just there in the presence of God, not doing anything. Extraordinary. I'm sure that what they saw was more powerful than what I saw in old father in the train. He was 95 when he died. They saw something. But there's more to say, because in what we're told about when they asked him, teach us to pray, the words were, Master, teach us to pray as John's disciples taught him to pray. That's also very interesting, because there is something different here. Because we know that the first two disciples, according to John's Gospel, were disciples of John the Baptist before they came to Jesus. Remember in John 2, is it? Behold the Lamb of God, was a John 1, who takes away the sins of the world. And two went to follow him. And he turned and said, What do you want? And they answered, Where do you live? And he said, Come and see. The first disciples were disciples of John the Baptist, who had been taught by John the Baptist how to pray John the Baptist's way, which probably was praying alone, because he'd spent how long in the desert preparing for his ministry. And while he was in the desert, <coughs> I'm sure he prayed alone. So now we've got the question. Teach us to pray as John's disciples taught him to pray. We know that when they saw him pray, they saw something I believe they'd never seen before. And so they're asking him, I want to learn to do what you're doing. That's what they're asking him. They're not saying, give us a prayer to say. And that's how we often read the teaching on prayer. But I think they're saying, what are you doing? We want to do that. Okay. Because it was so, I believe, so different. And for us as Catholics, what we're going to move into is not particularly surprising. But within the Protestant tradition, it is something that somehow was lost at the beginning of the Reformation and had to be regained. And that was even within the Catholic Church, there was in the 16th century a suspicion about praying alone. Why? I don't know what you're doing. You might be thinking something wrong. And that was a position. And within the Protestant tradition, there were groups, reformed groups, which were reforms of reforms, coming up, trying to re-establish this that Jesus is teaching us about prayer of praying alone. The Quakers are a good example of that. And they were persecuted and they had to flee to the United States. And all they wanted was to be able to pray alone, to re-establish this aspect of prayer, which is the prayer which Jesus teaches. Okay. So let's now, having set the context happening, what it looks like. Now look and see what Jesus says. Because unless you've got the context, you won't understand what he says. And the things that he says really, I think, are contained in chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel. Um, it's also in Luke that Matthew's more powerful. And also contained in the last discourses of St. John's Gospel. Discourse of John's Gospel are about love. They're about relationship with God, which is what prayer is. And so it's, it's an extraordinary um, treasure trove of things about prayer. And the funny thing is people struggle with the last discourse. And I think they're much the most beautiful things in the scriptures. Because if they are the last discourses, they're the last things he said. And you've got chapter 14, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. you've got four chapters, isn't it? And how wonderful. It's kind of like... The last will of destiny of Jesus. It's one of the last things he wants to say to his disciples before he goes. You need to pray for you need to. It's very important. So let's go now to begin to unpack Jesus' teaching because we want to know how he prayed. So that I might begin to learn how to pray. What's the first thing 
significant thing that he says as we look at, at John 6. When you pray, don't be like the Pharisees who stand on the street corners and make a spectacle of themselves. Okay, so then we at the beginning. A um, very good teacher. He begins by not telling what prayer is, but by telling what prayer isn't. And so he's beginning to pinpoint things which people thought were about prayer. Okay. I suppose for us, anything which you know, we do, uh, we do have things in, in the Catholic Church which attract attention. It's not to say we shouldn't do them, but Jesus is saying, this is not fundamentally what prayer is about. So it's not about processions and, and, and attracting attention. In their own way, those things are good because they, they, I suppose, they show things to other people. But in terms of your prayer life, he's saying, this is not what prayer is fundamentally about. It's the next thing he says. When you pray, don't be like the pagans. That's about the first thing is the, the Pharisees making spectacles of themselves. The next thing is, don't be like the pagans. What does he say about them? Who think that by saying many words, they will be your father knows already what you want. Okay. So, so what he's saying there is prayer is not about many words. So as I said to you this morning, you know, prayer for Lent doesn't mean coming into the church and saying five more roses. It may be a good thing to do, but, but it, it's not about saying things. Because as I began to say to you, it's about relationship. Okay? And saying more things doesn't make a better relationship. If you want to show your wife that you love her, you don't come home and give her a one hour home. It just doesn't make sense, does it? You don't show love by saying more things. In fact, very often love is revealed more profoundly in silence than in a multitude of words. Because where there are many words, it generally indicates, I don't feel comfortable with you. So in order to alleviate the silence, I'll say something. And that's very often what happens in prayer. I don't know what to do, so I better say as many things as I can say. And in the end, who have you been talking to? It's a, it, for, for the beginner, the question I always ask is two questions. Who are you talking to, yourself or God? Who are you with, yourself or God? Powerful questions for the beginner. Later on in prayer, it's, it's a different kind of question. But at the beginning of prayer, the, the, the aim is to get the soul focused on God. To begin to develop within the soul the ability to be alone, so as to be alone with God. And it's not easy. Not easy, which is why as we begin we try to sing and do things to fill it in. But if you're growing in prayer to a perfect certain point, the last thing you want is noise and prayers and things said. You simply want to be go away and be alone with God. That, for a discussed Carmelite, is the first indication of a call to a more mature prayer. So he says to us, no, when you pray, go to your private room where you're alone with your Father in heaven, who sees and rewards all things done in secret. No, when you pray, go to your private room where you're alone with your Father in heaven. Now. Now we're getting to something, something real, because now he's telling me something, rather than what not to do. So we can only understand that if we understand what Jesus means by go to your private room. Because he's now beginning to speak about his experience. And so we have to begin to ask ourselves to understand this. What is it like to be Jesus? Why is he saying this? What's the meaning of this for Jesus in his prayer? Otherwise, you don't know what you're saying. Well, let's begin by saying what it's not. It doesn't mean go to a private room and close your door. It can't possibly mean that. Because they didn't have private rooms. An average family probably would have had five, six, seven, eight, nine children. Did every child have a bedroom? No. Because it still remains a case that you don't. What does 
private room meeting. And more to the point, when Jesus is preaching this, saying, no, this is what we're going to do, go and pray, and obviously they would go off and pray. They, had, they didn't have anywhere to live. They were itinerants walking around in Israel. And he remains an itinerant until he dies, unless he's visiting the house in Bethany or visiting someone's house, they put him up. They didn't have their rooms, and we know that. Listen to the sadness in our Lord's voice. Come from <coughs> me, he says to someone. And he says, no, 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 no I, can, I, can I go home to my house first? And what does Jesus say? Listen, he says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Change that into, into the way it's, I believe it's, it should be heard. Foxes have holes, I want you to follow me. No, no, I want to go home first. Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. It's very sad, it's very poignant. He's talking about himself. He's not giving an instruction fundamentally. You want to follow me, then come follow me. But I've got nowhere to put my head. I have nothing to call my own. That's a consequence of my following my father, is that all the things which you treasure, and which I treasure, I now no longer have. And even foxes have got something to call them. And even birds of the air have got their own nests. But I don't have it. There's a real, it's, it's a very, it's so human. He's sharing with this young man. This is what I this is what I've had to do. And if you want to follow me, this is the way you have to go too. And he's not making it easy. He says, everyone's, even a Fox has got a place of their own, but I don't. So what does he mean when he says, when you pray, go to your private room? In fact, what that means, at least for, for us as Catholics, within the great contemplative and mystical tradition, which comes down to us over almost at least 1,800 years of reflection, the private room is not a physical space. It is the inner space of my own soul. Because I pray by entering into my inner space where I am with Jesus. But that's very hard. It took me about 20 years almost as a discount's car to suddenly begin to have a sense of what that meant. But if you want to follow Jesus, you have to be patient. You don't learn everything just like that. The private room, a physical space, is helpful if it helps you enter into your own soul. Because the great teaching of the discussed Carmelites is, and this is from the last discourses of John's Gospel, the greatest existential doctrine of the church is this. As much as Jesus being God and man and the Trinity and papal infallibility and all these things are lovely things, they don't really impact on you fundamentally. The greatest doctrine that we have for ourselves personally is the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit dwells in my soul. That is, tells me who I am, tells me what my life is about. And as I live this truth, my life changes because the God God, God is within me. <coughs> and more than any other thing that I know as a Catholic, that changes my life. Because every other truth kind of tosses the truth out there. But the truth of the indwelling of the Holy Trinity is the truth about me. And the private place that I go to pray is the place within myself that I'm not yet at, but that, that my life leads me to, that I try to get closer to by entering within myself, finding obstacles, working at them, and still trying to, to dent myself, because that's where God is. And in fact, that's where I'm called to. 
Your desire for God is not an externalized desire, but is fundamentally an internal matter, which you externalize in your attempt to live that desire. But it is and remains an internal matter. So the private place which Jesus presents to us, I believe, is within myself. So he says, no, but when you pray, go to your private room. And Teresa speaks about it, and she's the first woman doctor that the church has. The image she uses is, is the interior castles. Your soul is a mansion made of diamond. And at the central part of that mansion is the light and the beauty of God. And we spend our lives entering in ourselves. We're doing everything on the outside, but what happens out there helps me enter within myself in my prayer until I come closer and closer to the place where God is. And that, well, I don't know what it is for you, but that, that for me is what my life is about. It's about all these other things. I'm here talking to you, yes. That's not, not what my life is primarily about. It's about God and experience of God and finding God. Because if I can find God, my life will show you who God is. But if I can't find God, there's no point by doing anything for you about God. It's fudge. If I've got God, you'll see God. I can't teach you God. All we can do is show God to others. How? By being ourselves. Because if we're loved by God and we allow God to love us, we try to live as we should, our lives show us what God is. That's, that's the most authentic Christian ministry and preaching that you could possibly have. This is not dependent upon silly words or things. So, enter within. That's where we're told to pray. That's where we're invited to. And if it's true, you will experience here and now joy in hearing these words. John the Cross says, truths are known even before they're had. Because the truth of the gospel brings joy to the hearers. He says it brings joy to know that God dwells within you. And to know that everything that you seek is so close to you as to be in fact within you. And therefore you must search for him within yourself, crying out, where have you given hidden beloved? That's, I'm quoting from John the Cross in the first stanza of the spiritual canticle. So that's, now, now we're beginning to, to understand what Jesus is saying. When you pray, go to your private room. When you pray, enter within yourself, because that's where God is. Okay, let's move on, because I just want to do one more thing, because we're coming, it's already much time. I'm getting worse. Anyway, just want to give you one more thing before we take the next break. And it's. Which will I give you? Yeah, we will do this. It's a big thing, but I'll do it with you very briefly. Because so I've got another big thing to do before I get to Jesus' prayer. There's so much to do by way of preparation, just to look at one thing, isn't there? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's begin to have a sense of what, what Jesus' prayer was. What was Jesus doing when he was praying? Our first meeting of Jesus, properly speaking, which we find in the, in the three synoptic gospels, is not in the, the wise men coming to, to the birth or him being found in the temple. These are infancy narratives. But the, the core of the gospel is given to us in the three synoptic gospels, they begin with the baptism of Jesus. Mark just starts with that. The good news of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, and he went down to be baptized. Okay, so really the, the first marvelous thing we've got in the gospels is that as he came out of the waters, Mark and Luke put it this way, a voice was heard saying, you are my beloved son, my favour rests on you. Matthew uses, this is my beloved son. 
But we do know that the only one who heard the words was Jesus. The words were addressed to Jesus. And in order to begin to look at Jesus' prayer, we have to ask, what was it like for Jesus to hear these words? You are my beloved son, my favour rests on you. Joseph was not his father. He knew that Joseph wasn't his father. He was obedient to Joseph. He loved Joseph. Joseph loved him. Mary loved him. But in the midst of all the voices and all the things that were happening, humanly, Jesus did not know the physical touch of his real father. He didn't know what his father's voice sounded like. Um, you know, people who, whose parents died when they are very young, they look back and wish that they could have what they wanted these tangible things about the person that they've lost. I never knew my mother's voice. Well, my mother's still alive, but someone would say, I never knew my mother's voice. They're not giving you a fact. They're giving you the desire of their heart. I wish I'd heard my mother's voice. Yeah, I can't imagine my, the, the voices of my mother and father. Baptism, in terms of the gospel, it's the first time we're told Jesus heard the voice. And what does what the voice say? You are my beloved son. Extraordinary thing. And we have to ask, what does that mean for Jesus? And you, you stop and, and listen to the words. You are my beloved son. <coughs> the word son means I'm your father. So it's a statement, I'm your father. But the word beloved is very significant. It has resonances with the Song of Songs. But more powerfully within the contemplative tradition and within the scripture the, um, tradition, the word beloved means the one that is loved more than anyone else. The apple of my eye. That's in the King James Bible, isn't it? The word apple of my eye. You are the apple of my eyes, another way of putting it. That's what the word beloved means. There is no one that I love more than you. My favour rests on you. So, what's the meaning for Jesus? Who perhaps, for whom this is the first time he hears his father's voice. You're my son, there is no one that I love more than you, and I am proud of you. It's a funny thing. Because it is the thing that every child longs to and needs to hear from a parent. And insofar as they don't know that, there's a defect in their integrity. Whenever I do a baptism, I emphasize to the parents, there is one thing that you and only you can give this child. It's not a roof over the head, it's not education. The government can give you all of that. It's that by the age of 18, this child knows he or she is loved and that you love them. And that their integrity is built on the experience of this love. Only you can do this, so be, attend to it. And if the child doesn't have it, it will be that your sonship or your daughtership is built on knowing you're loved, is defective insofar as you think that you're not loved. It's built on knowing that your parent is proud of you and it's defective insofar as you think that you haven't been done to or haven't been the child that you should have been. I deal with this all the time, yes. If we don't know what this love is, what is it we're supposed to be? Yeah, it's a bigger today in prayer. That's why you can see the importance of prayer already and we'll get to that after lunch now. So let's see, what is it like to be Jesus? Suddenly, that's my father who says to me that I'm the one he loves more than anyone else. That's who I am as son. To be son is to be loved by this father more than anyone else. I'm the apple of his eye. And I give pleasure to him 
my favor rests on you. And what does he do? He doesn't go out to the desert to be tempted. Because we're told anyway that after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating, he's tempted. Because he's weak. He doesn't go out there to spend, I think I'm going to have 40 days without eating or drinking. I don't think Jesus was so obese that he thought I need to lose weight before I go and start my ministry. He went out there because he wanted to be with his father. And he probably forgot the time. Now what happened with his father is important and that's what the temptations tell you. The temptations tell you what happened. But at this stage we, we can say he went out there to be alone with his father who he knew loved him. And I think that's what he did then for the rest of his life. As often as he could, he would go away to be alone with his father who he knew loved him. And that's peculiar for me as a Carmelite, because in chapter 8 of the book of the Love of St. Teresa, one of her wonderful definitions of prayer says, for me prayer is nothing more than an intimate sharing between friends. It means taking time to be alone frequently with the one who I know loves me. She's, in terms of the mystical life, the greatest mystical right of the church as well. And powerful. What she says prayer is, I believe it's exactly what Jesus was doing. He'd go away to be alone with his father because this was the person who loved him. He went there for love's sake, as often as he could. And what did he do while he was there? What two good friends do because his father is his best friend. Shared everything. And his father shared with him. How do I know that? Because he says to us, I call you friends because I have made known to you everything my father has revealed to me. Everything that my father has shared with me, I'm sharing with you. I call you friends. And come to this after lunch. Because my relationship with my father is one of friendship. And I call my friend, you're my father's friend. And I'm inviting, and that's what he did. When he went away, he would take his friends with him to be alone with him as he was alone with his father. Very clever though. So they wanted to know what he was doing. So that they wanted to be part of his prayer. That's what our Lord does. He goes away to be alone with his father. And this is what's happening all the way through. He is going to be alone with the one who knows loves, loves him. And at the, the core of prayer is the love of God. And then therefore, what am I going to pray for? To be loved by God. That's the beginning of the answer to your question. To be loved by God. Because it doesn't matter how well you've been loved humanly, it is still defective. Some, for some, more defective than others. But prayer is to live in the presence of God so as to be loved by God. And that love integrates my life. That love gives me identity. Jesus' identity is determined by the love of his Father. And we hear that coming out. Once you know that, you can suddenly read the Gospels. That's coming out all the time. And that's what we're all called into. <clears throat> that's why he begins to teach us how to pray. And my call, our call, is to experience the love of God and allow that love to determine our lives. Because that's what it did for Jesus. In what way did the love of the Father determine Jesus' life? Do you think he wanted to go to Jerusalem and die? He didn't. He says he doesn't want to go there. He's tempted not to go there. But why does he go there? Because he loves his father. And as a, as a consequence of that love is to renounce himself, which means to go to Jerusalem and to die. But if you think he wants to go there and be tortured, I'm not going to follow such a man, because he doesn't. He goes there for love, because he builds his life on the love of the Father. And I believe authenticity, integrity, identity is grounded in this love. 
And that's why prayer is one of the places in which we establish our identity in the presence of God. Yes, but our identity indeed. Because like Jesus, prayer moves into going away frequently to be alone with the one who only loves me. And only in that do I know who I am. Because if you don't experience yourself as lovable, you don't know who you are. Sadly, 21st century Australia is full of people who either don't believe they're loved or don't believe they're lovable. No identity. And I mean this all the time. Identity is built on love. Initially, in growing up in the love of parents, but as we mature and grow in Christ, it's built on perfect love. Identity comes from the love of God. And that's probably a good place to stop. We will come back. We've got, we'll, we'll come back after a quick lunch because we've got two more sessions. Because otherwise I won't get to Jesus' prayer because I have to show you how Jesus teaches so that you know how to read the Our Father. And once you know how to read it, you begin to pray it. So we'll come back. We, we we'll be back by 1.30.